In this video, we are going to learn about parametric surfaces. Our experience with parametric equations so far has been to define a curve with a vector function r of t, which is equal to x of t, y of t, z of t. In the three-dimensional case, in the two-dimensional case, it would just be x of t, y of t. And these vector functions define curves. We've drawn plenty of them, so let's just sketch one example in three space. We'll draw a simple closed curve, C. Remember these curves have direction to them. And the way the vector function defines the curve is we plug in values of t, we output vectors, we draw those vectors from the origin out to the curve. The terminal point of the vector is the point on the curve. And we accumulate all of the points along the curve, in this case the curve C. So this defines a one-dimensional curve in terms of one parameter t with parametric equations x of t, y of t, and z of t. So make note that a curve is a one-dimensional object. Even if we're drawing it in two-space or three-space, the curve itself is one-dimensional since it's defined in terms of only one variable or one parameter in this case. So we've spent a lot of time with vector functions and curves in particular, most recently with our line integrals. So now we're going to look to extend this idea of parameterization to surfaces. And that will set us up for surface integrals. So a similar technique can be used to parametrically define a surface with a vector function r of uv, which is equal to x of uv, y of uv, z of uv. So a couple of things to pay attention to here. The first is we're now parameterizing in terms of two variables as opposed to one. So we have the parameters u and v. The second unfortunate consequence that they chose the next two letters in the alphabet, u and v, is that those two letters look very similar to one another. Make your best effort to try to differentiate the way you write your u's and your v's so that we don't mix them up as we go through the process of parameterizing surfaces. So how does this define a surface? Well, very similar to the way it did for curves. So if we draw a simple surface, label it s, we plug in a value of u and v, we're going to output a vector that we draw from the origin, and the terminal point is a point on the surface, so that's our vector. Now because we have two parameters, we can hold one constant while letting the other one change. So let's say we held u constant and let v changed. So we'd get a bunch of vectors. And what would happen is we would define all the points on what we call a grid line. So on that red line, which is a grid line on the surface, if u is constant and v is changing, we define all the points on that line. Very similar to that, if we hold v constant, we would get a different grid line by letting u change. And we define all of those points on the surface. And then we let u and v continue to change, and we will wind up defining all of the points on a surface using just the two parameters u and v. Okay, so again, all based on drawing vectors from the origin out to points, in this case on the surface as opposed to a curve. So this defines a two-dimensional surface in terms of two parameters u and v with parametric equations x of uv, y of uv, and z of uv. Right, so surfaces are two-dimensional objects. The way I like to always remember that is when we're dealing with surfaces, we often look to find surface area. An area is two-dimensional. Right, so that always makes sense for me. So show that the given vector function represents an elliptic paraboloid. So here's our first example of a parameterized surface, r of uv, equaling u cosine v, u sine v, u squared. So our goal is to bring it back in terms of x's and y's and z's to hopefully show that it represents the equation of an elliptic paraboloid. So the first thing we're going to want to do is get it out of the form of a vector and into parametric equations. So Let's go x equals u cosine v, 
y equals u sine v and z equals u squared. So now we need to figure out ways to eliminate the parameters u and v to then create an equation in terms of x, y, and z. So the first thing I notice looking at the x equals y equals parametric equations here is we have a cosine v and a sine v. So if we were to square them and get cos squared plus sine squared, we'd be able to make use of the Pythagorean identity. So the first thing we're going to do here is combine those two pieces. So x squared plus y squared would be equal to u squared cosine squared v plus u squared sine squared v, which then is x squared plus y squared equals u squared, since cos squared v plus sine squared v is 1. Now we need to figure out a way to get the z involved. So if we look at the other part of our parameterization, z equals u squared. But we just figured out that x squared plus y squared also equals u squared. So that means that we can say that x squared plus y squared equals z. And that is the equation of an elliptic paraboloid. So we've accomplished our goal. The other nice thing to see here is we're going to try to work in the opposite direction. So coming up with our own parameterizations. So using sines and cosines is definitely going to be a tool that we're going to rely on. I also included the graph of this surface just so you can see the grid lines clearly. So all the circular grid lines here, that's where we're letting u stay constant because u is really like a radius and v, which is the angle change. That's going to create all those circular grid lines. And then if we hold v constant, which is the angle and let u change, that would be all the vertical grid lines that you see on the surface of the elliptic paraboloid. And the reason I like to at least see this is often when a computer is generating a three-dimensional graph, it is doing it in the form of a parameterization of the surface and creating these grid lines to create the graph. Okay, so now our main goal in this video is coming up with our own parameterizations. So we need to discuss a few techniques to do that. So if the equation of the surface is given where one variable is defined explicitly in terms of two other variables, then we set those two variables equal to u and v to create our parameterization. This is called the trivial parameterization. So essentially we're just substituting two of the three variables with u and v, defining the third one in terms of u and v based on our substitution, and that creates our parameterization. So find the parametric representation of the following surfaces. So first up, we have z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. So z is explicitly defined as a function of x and y. So for the parameterization, what we can do is we could say, all right, let's let x be u. Let's let y be v. And we have r of u v. So the x component, well, x is u, y is equal to v, and then z would be equal to the square root of u squared plus v squared. And we've parameterized, in this case, the cone, z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. Now, in reality, the whole idea is we're just trying to define the surface in terms of two variables. We use u and v just to visualize that process so that we can see that we have indeed changed the representation of the surface. But honestly, we could also create a parameterization and call the parameters x and y and basically say, okay, let x stay x, let y stay y, and then z defined in terms of x and y is x squared plus y squared. For a lot of students, this second parameterization makes a lot more sense than the u's and the v's. And at the end of the day, we've accomplished the goal we're looking to accomplish, which is to find the surface in terms of two variables. So now let's look at y equals xz. So let's do uv first, and then we can go to a more, even more trivial parameterization. So we could say x is u, z is v. So the parameterization in terms of u and v, that would be u 
And then remember, y is equal to xz, so the middle component is uv, and then z is v. So where we put our parametric equations is really important as well. Or we could say that we're just parameterizing in terms of x and z, right? Those two variables, and then x stays x, y is xz, and z stays z. Again, we've accomplished our goal. We've reduced the equation to a parameterization in terms of two variables. Parameterize the upper hemisphere of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. And I gave us a graph just so we can sketch what that upper hemisphere might look like. So we have the upper half of a sphere, radius 2, x, y, z. Okay, in this case, we don't have any of the variables explicitly defined in terms of the other two, right? It's not x equals or y equals or z equals. So that's the first thing we can do here is we can get it so that it's x equals, y equals, or z equals. Now that decision is based on the fact that we are looking to parameterize the upper hemisphere. So let's solve the equation for z. So z squared would equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. So z equals plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Now normally, this would present an issue. If we tried to parameterize the whole sphere with a trivial parameterization, we cannot use a plus or minus in that parameterization. Remember, these are vector functions that we're creating, and they need to follow the rules of functions. One input, one output. And a plus or minus in one of the components really is giving us two outputs, which means we would need two separate parameterizations. But here we avoid that issue because of the fact we're defining the upper hemisphere. That's only going to be the positive square root. If we were defining the lower hemisphere, also not an issue, we would take the negative square root in our parameterization. Again, now that we have, and let's rewrite it without all the marking, so z equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared, and that's the upper hemisphere. So we can create a trivial parameterization. We want u's and v's, so let x be u, y be v. We want to keep it in terms of x's and y's, that's fine too. So we'll do both. So r of u, v, that's going to be u, v, square root of 4 minus u squared minus v squared. We want it in terms of x and y, that's fine. x stays x, y stays y. z then is 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And we've parameterized the surface. Now, that issue, if we had the whole sphere, we're going to come back to that. And we'll see a better way to define the sphere parametrically if we're trying to parameterize the whole thing. All right, so if the surface has circular cross-sections, it is often helpful to define two variables in terms of sine and cosine to create our parameterization. And we've seen this already with our elliptic paraboloid. But the cone that we parameterize, which we see again here, the sphere, those all have circular cross-sections. So some sort of parameterization with sine and cosine is going to be helpful. Often we want to think like cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Not exactly, because those have three variables. We need only two. But they're going to be very similar the way we parameterize our surfaces to those cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems. So find the parametric representation of the cone, z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. So for the trivial parameterization, we didn't really need to sketch anything out. But here, it's worthwhile to quickly draw the cone, just so we can see those circular cross-sections. Right, so if we drew grid lines, right, we would see those circular grid lines on the cone. And z moves up, but the circles are parallel to the xy plane, which kind of makes sense because z is a function of x and y. So here, we want to define x and y in terms of 
sines, and cosines. And really, a cylindrical or a polar type parameterization is going to work nicely here. So I'm actually going to start with variables we know, and then we can convert it to u's and v's at the end. So let's parameterize this in terms of r and theta. Kind of weird here because we're using two r's. One is the vector function and one is a parameter. So it's one of the reasons we try to stay away from this and use u and v's, but I think it makes more sense here. Okay, so those circular grid lines we're trying to define, the radius is changing, and so is the angle. So we can say x is r cos theta, y would be r sine theta, and if we replace that into our equation, we'd have the square root of r squared, which is just r, so that means z then equals r. And as far as bounds on the parameter, just to start to introduce that idea, right? we would restrict theta to be 0 to 2 pi. We wouldn't want to keep going around and around the surface. R, well, that could be anything, right? because the cone extends infinitely. Now again, we want using v's easy enough, just change out the variable. So we could say u cosine v, u sine of v, and u. And now the bounds would be on v as opposed to theta for that 0 to 2 pi. Okay, now sticking with the idea of restrictions, if we only want the part of the cone below z equals 3, what restrictions would we need to place on the parameters? Well, our z here, and I'll stick with the u and v since we have it here, the z component of our vector function is just u. So if we want the cone to be below z equals 3, well, that means we want u to be less than or equal to 3. And we could also say greater than or equal to 0 if we want a complete restriction on u. So then we'd have a v restriction and a u restriction. And the reason it's helpful to start introducing these ideas is as we shift into our surface integrals, we're going to need bounds of integration. And those bounds are going to be these restrictions on u and v that we create when we parameterize. So now back to the sphere. Find the parametric representation of the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. So now in this case, we're drawing the whole sphere. And if we want the whole sphere, we already talked, we can't solve for one variable because we'd get that plus or minus, and that plus or minus is just not going to work to create a vector function. So this is where the sines and the cosines come into play. In order to parameterize a sphere, we're going to use something very similar to spherical coordinates. What changes is we are dealing with a surface here. And on the surface, the radius always stays the same. Here, the radius in this sphere is always going to be 2. So think about your spherical conversions. x was rho sine phi cos theta. Y was rho sine phi sine theta, Z was rho cosine phi, but basically we're going to replace the rho with the radius of the sphere that we're defining. So it's going to look like this. So we'll define in terms of only theta and phi. No rho, because the radius is constant. Okay, so X is going to be the radius, so 2 sine phi cos theta y would be 2 sine phi sine theta, and z is going to be 2 cosine phi. And as far as the bounds go, if we want the whole sphere, we'll just remember the bounds on theta and phi from the spherical coordinate system. Theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Phi is going to go from 0 to pi and that would define the whole sphere with this parameterization. Okay, so like I said, not exactly spherical coordinates, but close enough that we can consider them to be extremely helpful. Now, if we only want the part of the sphere above the plane z equals 1, what restriction on the parameters would we need to change? So now imagine we come here, and we're going to cut this with the plane z equals 1, that's z equals 1. 
So we only want the part of the sphere that's above. So like up here. Okay, well, theta is still going to be 0 to 2 pi, but our phi value is going to change, right? The angle that we come off of the z-axis is going to change. So we have to figure out what that new angle is going to be. So if z equals 1, we know that z equals rho cosine phi in spherical. So 1 equals 2 cosine phi from our parameterization. And probably better to use the parameterization than back to spherical. So let's erase that. We don't need that. Although it would still be helpful. Okay, so we set the z part of our parameterization equal to 1. So 2 cosine phi equal 1, which means 1 half equals cosine phi, which means phi equals pi over 3. So then the restriction on phi would have to go from 0 to pi over 3. And that would be the change that we would make. All right Now, some surfaces, such as cylinders, are defined in terms of only two variables. In this case, we define the curve in terms of one variable, so just like it's a normal curve, and then the missing variable is going to be the second parameter. So find the parametric representation of the following surfaces. So we'll start with a plane, y plus z equals 10. So this plane is only defined in terms of two variables. So here, we're going to parameterize in terms of one variable. So let's say we let y be u. Then we're going to define z in terms of u because we need the other parameter for x, which is missing. So r of uv here is going to be v for x, and then u for y, and 10 minus u for z. And that's changeable. We could have said u was x, v was y, and then 10 minus v. Could you keep it in terms of x and y? Sure. We could say x, y, x stays x, y stays y, then z is 10 minus y. That works too, right? We've reduced it to two variables. Then we have x squared plus y squared equals 25, so this is a cylinder. So we're going to parameterize the circle with one of the parameters, and then we'll reserve the other parameter for z, because z is missing. So here, we'll say u, v, Okay, so we'll say that x is 5 cosine u, y is 5 sine u. reason we're using the 5 as a radius and not one of the parameters is we're always going to have a radius of 5 on the cylinder. Right? We have none of the interior points. We're only on the surface of the cylinder. And then v is your z. Could you say r of theta z, more like cylindrical coordinates? Sure. 5 cos theta, 5 sine theta, z stays z. We've defined it in terms of two variables. If we have an elliptic cylinder, what we can do is we can divide everything by 16. So x squared over 16 plus z squared over 4 equals 1. And then you can think of this as x over 4 squared, z over 2 squared equals 1. And again, we want to stick with theta, so we could say theta and y, since y is missing. So then x would be 2 cos, or 4 cos, let me get that right, 4 cosine, 4 cosine theta y stays y, and then z would be 2 sine theta, right? And for these cylinders, we can say that theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, just to keep bringing through that idea of restrictions. Okay. But again, our goal is to define the surface in terms of two variables. Whether it's u and v or two other parameters, doesn't matter as long as we accomplish our goal.
So now parameterize the portion of the plane y equals z inside the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. x squared plus z squared rather equals 1. Okay, so we can draw this just to get a sense of what we're looking at. So x squared plus z squared equals 1. That's going to be a cylinder that goes around the y-axis this way. Then we're going to take y equals z and cut the plane, so it's going to go something like this, our best effort. Okay, so we're going to get this elliptic-like region that we're trying to parameterize. So this is what we're trying to parameterize, that part of the plane. Okay, so in order to do that, we'll first start by just parameterizing based off the x squared plus z squared equals 1. And then we'll define y in terms of whatever parameterization we get. Now, we do have all the points inside, so the radius isn't always 1 here, because we have interior points on the plane inside of the cylinder. So for our parameterization, our parameterization we're going to do in terms of r and theta, because the radius can change and so can theta. So this is going to be r cos theta for x, r sine theta for z, which then makes y equal to r sine theta as well, since y equals z. Now, the way to make sure that we're inside of the cylinder is put bounds on our parameters. So since we have to be inside the cylinder of radius 1, r has to be between 0 and 1 and theta has to be between 0 and 2 pi. Again, we want u's and v's, change out r for u, theta for v, and we would accomplish that goal. But here we've parameterized the portion of the plane inside the cylinder. So as things start to interact, we have to adapt our parameterizations. It's not always going to look exactly the same. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about is the fact that it's often helpful to find the equation of the tangent plane to a surface at a given point. We've done this already using the gradient vector as the normal vector of the plane, but parametric surfaces give us another way to find the tangent plane. And the way we do that, for a parametric surface, r of uv, we evaluate the vector function at a point, u0, v0, that gives us our point for the tangent plane, then we can compute the cross product of two tangent vectors, and that's going to create the normal vector. So just quickly sketching out so you can kind of get a sense of what we're doing here, we can draw that same simple surface as before. So there's our surface. We plug in, so we get a vector. So that's r of u0, v0, defining that point. Then at that point, we can draw two tangent vectors. So here, I'll stick with the same colors as before. So let's say that way, that would be the partial with respect to u. That would give us a tangent vector to the surface. And then this way, that would be the partial with respect to v. That would give us a tangent vector. And the cross product, ru cross rv, gives us that normal vector we're looking for. Okay, so it's just another way to define the equation of a plane. So our last example, find the equation of the tangent plane to the helicoid defined by r of u v being u cosine v, u sine v 3 v at the point 1 rad 3 pi. So parametric surfaces also allow us to define some pretty unique surfaces as well. All right, so here they didn't give us a u naught v naught. They gave us the actual point in 3 space, so then we need to use it to work backwards to find the u naught and the v naught. So basically we know that u cosine v equals 1, u sine v equals rad 3, and 3v equals pi. So that means v equals pi over 3. So that means u times cosine of pi over 3, which is 1 half, equals 1, u equals 2. So we didn't need that middle equation. So we have our u and our v. That's helpful. Next, we need our two tangent vectors. So take the partial with respect to u, so that's going to be cosine v, sine v, 0. The partial with respect to v, 
is going to be negative u sine v, u cosine v, 3. Now, we're done with all the calculus. We don't have any more partial derivatives or integration to do, just a cross product. So we can plug in now at this point. So r of u evaluated at 2 pi over 3. That's going to be 1 half rad 3 over 2, 0. Partial with respect to v at, let's change that notation, at 2 pi over 3 is going to be negative rad 3, 1, 3. Then we have to cross these. So r of u crossed r of v. And the reason we do this is this cross product with the tangent vectors r of u and r of v is something we're going to use quite often coming up. So might as well start to get used to it now. Okay, so this cross product is going to be 3 rad 3 over 2 minus 0. Then the negation of 3 over 2 minus 0. And then 1 half plus 3 over 2. So we get a normal vector of 3 rad 3 over 2, negative 3 over 2, and 2. So then we can write the equation of the tangent plane. So 3 rad 3 over 2 times x minus 1 plus or minus minus 3 halves y minus rad 3 and then plus 2 z minus pi equals 0. And that's the equation. I'll just move it down there. That's the equation of the tangent plane at the given point. So a lot of new elements in this video. We've never really parameterized a surface before. So we talked about a couple of techniques to do that. We ended with this tangent plane example just to introduce the idea of the cross product of the two tangent vectors because that's going to be something that we see quite often in coming videos. So practice with all this, get comfortable, and I'll see you in the next video.